want you to say this. Say, I was made for more than this. Have you ever, have you ever been at work after a long week and you're just, man, I, there's got to be more to life than this. I used to work at General Motors on the assembly line. Uh, my dad helped me get that job. It was an amazing, uh, amazing blessing in my life. Uh, and I got to make sure I say that because uh, it didn't take long for me to, to really not like that job very much at all. Uh, I am not an assembly line worker. But you don't know that until you start on the assembly line. Now, at General Motors at the Arlington plant over there, cars come down. It's like a little train rail. And cars come down this through your workstation. Uh, you get one car about every minute. So just about every minute you're doing the job you just did, you're doing it again. And then again, and then again. And uh, for me, it was just the most monotonous thing because uh, I would look, you, you, you've been to work, and they'll tell you, you know, don't watch the clock because it makes it go slower. And you can just imagine every time a car goes by, that's a minute. So it's like watching the second hand. You look down the assembly line, and you see the next 28 minutes of your life coming around the corner. And that's as far as you can see. And the, car, and the cars, the part I worked is in the body shop, and the cars, they're not really cool yet. They're just this metal, silver shell. They have no front fender. It's just the, the cabin, and, and we put the doors on. And so uh, part of my job for a little while there was I, I checked the torque on the bolts on the driver's side doors. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a difficult job. I had a tor- an air torque gun, and I would go to the hinge bolts, and I'd go chip, 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 and I'd hit these bolts and then turn it, hit the other six, and then cars going by, and the trunk is open, and they just put the trunk lid on, and they called it a deck lid there. And, uh, and so then I had a different wrench, and I had to check the torque on the two bolts that would hold the deck lid, the trunk, onto the hinge. And uh, simplest job in the world, making almost 20 bucks an hour to do this, and this was in the 80s. So you would think anybody in his right mind would love this job, except me. Because for some reason, I thought I would just, on a whim, count how many bolts I'm tightening. In a week's time, I would, I I mean, yeah, in a week's time, I would tighten 43,200 bolts. That's a lot of bolts. And then that number's going through your head. And your gun kind of gets hung up on something and you get behind and, you know, you, don't, you can't shut down the assembly line. I mean, I think you could actually have fallen down and been wedged in it and they're not going to stop it for you because, you know, we don't stop the assembly line for nobody. I actually got my arm stuck in a car door once at the assembly line and it's, I'm like, shut it off, shut it off. And they're just like, no, no, and they just pulled my arm right out, just ripped skin off anyway. It didn't take too long for me working in that environment to realize I was made for more than this. 43,200 volts a week. That's crazy. Then I started doing the math. If I made it for 30 years, oh, my gosh, just going insane. And I know surely in your life you've looked at your, your life after a long, hard week or picking up the kids' toys or the never-ending pile of laundry cleaning the house again. You've asked yourself, surely my life was made for more than this. And I want to tell you, you are absolutely right. Your life is made for more than all of that. If life was just about that, what would be the point? It's so, so just like us, though, to get so focused on the negative things in our life that we blind ourselves where we can't see the possibilities of what God wants to do for us. Were you made for more than just one week of vacation a year? Surely you were. Were you made for more than just collecting? Remember when Beanie Babies was the thing? People's mission was like, wasn't it McDonald's that did Beanie Babies for a while? 
mean, y'all crazy people were lined up getting those beanie babies. Like, what in the world? Surely, you know, surely your life is about more than just becoming rich, amassing wealth, having, you know, a bunch of cars. Surely your life, your life has got to be more than just mowing grass and having diagonal lines. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. I notice those things. Is there anything wrong with any of that stuff? No, there's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. But if that's what your life is about, you're missing it. So what, what is our life supposed to be about? Let me, I want to give you our original job description before sin came into the earth. So the original thing that Adam was created to do. Have you ever thought about that? What, what you know, if, if, if this is what my life is about, you know, is, that, is, is this what my life is about? Let's, let's roll back in time. And let me give you Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. All right, here is the original job description. Now, this is before sin entered the, wor- the world. Now, let me say this. This is not listed because it was just a given that the, the greatest thing that we did, we would have done if Adam hadn't have blown it, uh, was we would commune with God all day long. We would have this relationship with Him. It's not even listed in the job description because it was just the given. There was God was just there. His presence was there. Adam would talk with God. He would walk with God. I mean, I don't even know what that looks like. I mean, at that time in Scripture, God is a spirit. What did, you know, anyway, it just blows my mind. What did that even look like? How did Adam walk and talk with God? But he did have a job. So here it is, Genesis 1.28. Then God blessed them and said, here it is, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. So the original job description was reproduce and rule the earth. That's the original job description before sin came in, was to have kids and take care of those kids, basically. Have kids and make sure the garden looks good, make sure the squirrels, you got them all named, and all that stuff that Adam did. And I can assure you, in the original setting, that would have brought such fulfillment because sin had not entered the world and it hadn't corrupted everything that we touched. Everything got corrupted by sin. So our physical responsibility, or that that back then was a physical responsibility, but it was inside the presence of God. You know what I've discovered now is when you have the presence of God, you can do a very mundane job and still feel fulfilled. When you have the presence of God, you can, you can still do the laundry and still love your family and your children. You can still do with a smile. Now, it might get old, but as long as you've got the presence of God, it makes all the difference. But when sin came, the presence of God was taken from us. Actually, Adam was told that if he was to eat of the wrong tree, that he would die, what that actually, that word death there actually means to be separated from God. In other words, sins come in and it has cut you off from the presence of God. So in, in the original description, our, it was our physical responsibility. I would tell you today that, that there's two responsibilities. There's the physical responsibility of every person on the planet, and there's also a spiritual responsibility. But just for a minute, I want to talk to you about the physical responsibility. Because if all you do in life is the things you're physically responsible for, it will only satisfy the physical. The physical responsibilities of our life will only satisfy the physical. If you're, if you're all about making money, you're making money, but it's only going to satisfy that part of your life and it won't satisfy it ever fully because there's always more money to be made. If you think, well, if I get all the clothes and all, the, I don't know what I'm talking about laundry. Wow, that was loud. I don't know what I'm talking about laundry today, but if you were to get all of the laundry done, the only way you can get all the laundry done is be completely naked. And the only way you can keep the laundry done is to not put any clothes on. But if you were were like, man, my goal in life is to get all the laundry done and be completely naked and never get get anything, what have you accomplished? Nothing. Because you can't leave anywhere. Well, you could, but you'll get arrested. You see, because of our sin nature, 
satisfying the things in the physical, it will never satisfy our soul. Put your hands right here. Come on, just play along. Right? There, there is a you on the inside. And that you on the inside will never be satisfied with things on the outside. It just doesn't work that way. We, 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 we try so hard to, to cover and to mask and to shadow and to, to bring excitement and to bring joy to the us on the inside. But if we just do it with things on the outside, it never will connect. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. You, you know that feeling when you got a new car. You know that feeling when you got new shoes. You, you remember being in grade school and, and you got your new shoes and you're on the playground and you're so happy about your new shoes and that one stinky, smelly kid walks up and puts his foot right on top of your shoe and just gets it all dirty and you just want to die because for five seconds you felt amazing but then it's over. You know what it's like to have the new car and it's so cool while it's new and it smells good until milkshake spills on the front seat. You want to kill somebody because you're trying to protect a, a spiritual feeling with a physical thing and it just doesn't work. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 15 through 16. Proverbs, man, if you don't read Proverbs, you've got to start reading some Proverbs. There's some really good stuff. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 15 and 16. It says, the horse leech has two daughters. Let's just stop right there. When it says leech, y'all know what a leech is? It is a bloodsucker. A leech, now I didn't do a lot of studying on this, but I, I know enough just from what I have studied in the past on leeches. Leeches have one job, and it's to suck the life out of you. And they, ha they are good at it. You could take a little bitty leech about this big, and you'd think, well, that little leech, he can't do much at all because he's just a little baby leech. He will grow. And he will grow bigger and faster than you thought he could. And he will never get full. He will just get bigger and stretch longer and get bigger. And this is talking about a leech, a horse leech. So it says the horse leech has two daughters or two things come from the, from the leech. And they cry and they say, give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied. Yea, four things that never say it is enough. The first one is the grave. The grave will never be full enough. There's always room for another dead person. The barren womb. You can't, you can't adopt enough kids. You can't babysit enough kids. If you have a barren womb, you have a barren womb, and there's nothing that can satisfy that except a child. The other one it says is the earth that is not filled with water. Man, we got rain for how many days the other day? Some of you, your yards couldn't even... Some, I, I drove Pat, we drove the van on Wednesday night, and, you know, some, some places out there, you know, where there's not real good drainage. Man, we're going by, you see a house and the road, and it looks like the house is sitting in a lake, and it's just water all the way around the house. You maybe can make out a driveway. If I drive back down there today, there will be some puddles, but all that water has been sucked up by the earth. And the other one is the fire, the fire that saith not, it is enough. You can't quench fire. As long as there's something to burn, fire is going to keep going. And the Bible brings that out, and I will bring it out to you today, because if we're not careful, we will live our life trying to satisfy our soul with things of the world, and things of the world will never satisfy us. It will never be enough. You can get drunk, and you can puke, and pass out, but they go right back to the drink. It's never enough. You can't, you can't get high enough. You can get high. You can get high for a while, but the high goes away. You, 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 you just can't satisfy the soul with things of the flesh. If we only pursue fleshly goals, we'll never be satisfied. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 8. Love this passage. This is in the New Living. Love the way it says it. It says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. You see that where it says, from that sinful nature? In other words, we're, we're using sin to try to satisfy our sinful nature. But then it says, but those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So he's just kind of, you know, God's just saying, 
you got to figure this out. Don't be stupid about this. What he's saying, he says, he says, don't be misled. You know, that's a real nice way of saying don't be ignorant. Don't be dumb. If you plant something, it's going to grow. Have you noticed that? For years, when we used to, where we used to live in the country, we had an acre lot, and three-quarters of that acre lot was stickers. We actually got flats on the riding lawnmower from grass birds. I mean, it would just be, you'd try to roll down through there, you know, at that time of the year, and you, I, I never wore goggles. I don't know. I was freaking out. I was freaking out a little bit just thinking about what I was fixing to say. Because not only do you have the grasshoppers hopping up on you when you're trying to mow, but you've got stickers flying off that are shooting right at your eyeballs. They're trying to take you out. I mean, bad grass birds. Uh, and so somebody told me that I should go out there. Man, who, who makes this stuff up? I should go out there with a hoe, and before the stickers start blooming stickers, uh, take a hoe and identify the plant and cut them out. Cut them out of the ground. And if you cut them out, then you won't have stickers. Have you ever heard that crazy nonsense? Well, it might work unless one sticker plant gets past you, and you hit it with a lawnmower, because then stickers have just gone, just, you just spread them. And then I was doing that one day. I was out there with my little hoe in my bucket. Let's remember, I used to do this all the time. I'd be out there for probably three times as much time it takes to mow the grass. I was out there just cutting stickers. And this one old guy stopped by, and he goes, he goes what are you doing? You know how those old guys are, curious about everything. I find myself being that way more and more. What are you doing? Now, man, I'm cutting these stickers out, so I won't have stickers anymore. He goes, oh, Really? He goes, you know, a sticker seed can lay in the ground for seven years. Good luck. (sighs) So now I'm thinking, not only do I have to cut every sticker plant that's growing now, but I'm going to have to do this for seven years to cut the harvest that was planted before I ever moved here. We just will have stickers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We'll just let them grow. We'll have a great crop of stickers. But what the Bible's saying is, if you plant something, it is going to grow. And if you plant things that don't matter, you will get a harvest of things that don't matter. And he's telling you, don't be deceived by that, because if you think things that don't matter can turn into things that do matter, you're deceived. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows... That will he also reap. If he sows to the Spirit, he will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So what he's telling us, man, you've got to plant things that are going to bring the harvest you want. We had a garden for a little while, and uh, Leslie wanted tomatoes. And so we planted, we're we're not big, you know, healthy eaters, so it wasn't like we had kale and broccoli. You know, we had like, you know, tomatoes and maybe cucumbers or something. I don't know, just basic salad stuff that you could get at Walmart. But anyway, we were gardening. And uh, after a few tomatoes, you know, then you got tomatoes everywhere. Then you got to have a fruit stand. You know, you're bringing bags. You know, it's like people with chickens. You know, they're always giving eggs out, you know. We got tomatoes everywhere. After a while, I'm like, I don't want any more tomatoes. I'm sick. I mean, how many ways can you cook tomatoes? You know, we, start, I mean, there's to- so we just let them go, man. There's tomato bushes out there, weeds growing through it, tomatoes hanging off, tomatoes. So finally, I'm getting so, it just looks terrible. We are done with tomatoes. So I take the lawnmower, and I just, just plow right through the tomatoes, man. Tomatoes are flying. You know, it's just a mess. But in just a few minutes, man, I had them all gone. It was just perfect until next spring. And the little patch where the tomatoes used to grow has now spread to the entire place we had the garden, and there are tomato plants coming up everywhere. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever you sow, you will reap. So we so often get caught into this trap of we don't like our life. We're not happy with where we are. Well, don't complain because it's your garden. You planted it. Sometimes it's time to take the Holy Ghost lawnmower and just plow right through that and start over, amen? Because if you will plant seeds that bring life, 
you will have a life of life. My parents, they, uh, they get blessed with so many great deals on houses and cars. And, I mean, it's just crazy. It's like every time I turn around, there, something else has happened and somebody's blessed them again. You know, that didn't happen overnight. It's because they have sown seeds of righteousness. They have planted and planted and planted. Alex, the other day, he was working on, you know, he's working on him and Brenna about to get married sometime. I'm not going to give any dates away or anything, but about to get married. And so they're working on, you know, an apartment. And, uh, man, if I had time, I would tell you the story. Maybe he could share it sometime. But the circumstance around this apartment that they ended up getting is just mind-blowing. There's no way that it could be anything short of a miracle. And I told Alex, I said, you know what, Alex? It's because for years and years you have sown seeds. And now you're at, you know, but you've lived with mom and dad. And mom and dad are your covering. And, and we have provided and we have blessed you. But now you're about to step out on your own, and God has got all of these blessings. They've just begun to grow and build and build and build and build, and you're about to step out on your own, and you're going to see the windows of heaven open, and God is going to pour out blessings like the Word says because you have planted seeds of righteousness. And we've got to be careful what we're planting, and we've got to be purposeful of what we plant. Here's something you need to write down. The greatest joy... And fulfillment in life comes from helping other people. The greatest joy you'll ever have. If you want to have a life that feels fulfilled and feels full and whole, it's not going to come from sitting in your room playing video games. Now, if you want to play video games, that's great. I've played a few video games, love it. You know, nowadays you play video games a little different where you're like playing video games with somebody in China and all that kind of stuff. I don't even know how that even works. But anyway, there is multiple ways playing video games to reach lost people and to make connections with them and be a blessing with them. There's so many things that we can do in our life that we can use to bless other people. But the greatest joy and the greatest fulfillment in your life will come from helping other people. Somebody say, I've got to help other people. See, that's what Up Week's about. Up Week is to give you an opportunity to jumpstart you to help other people, to find out what I've discovered in church, most people don't know what they're good at. They know, you know, if you ask them, well, what do you do? And they'll tell you what they do. Most of the people aren't real happy about what they do. They just do what they do to make a living. But if you will try some things this week, it will blow your mind how you find out what you're good. I didn't know I was a preacher. I didn't know that until they kept asking me to preach. I did magic shows. I had puppets and magic could do a great magic trick. That was my thing. And then they finally said, or one time they kept saying, why don't you share something? I'm like, I do magic tricks. What do I do? I do a little object lesson. And uh, it was in Brownwood, Texas that uh, I preached. And I gave my first altar call. And about as many adults as kids came. It was a kid's service. Man, 1,500 people came to the altar. I had, no, I had no clue. I had no idea. You just don't know. Remember, I used to tighten bolts at General Motors. When you're planting spiritual seeds, they will always grow. You, they may not grow as fast. You notice that weeds grow up overnight? You know, but tulips take a little while, right? put that bulb in in the winter or something, and you got to wait till spring before you forgot clear about them, and all of a sudden there's this thing coming up, and you're going, what, the, what in the world is that weird-looking thing? Oh, yeah, it's a tulip. Planted like six months ago. You're planting spiritual seeds. When you're, when you're helping other people, you're, you're planting spiritual seeds. Putting this together a little bit last night, I wrote this down. God is not Vegas. How many of you have been to Vegas? You don't have to raise your hand. If you want to, you can. I've been there a couple times. It's a crazy, crazy place. The thing I've learned about, the first, first time we were in Vegas, this is just story time with Pastor Gary. First time we were in Vegas, I found a nickel on the floor. I put it in a nickel slot machine, and I won 55 cents. <laughs> Thank you. I know, I'm a big high roller gambler. I know. That was the extent of my winning in Vegas. You see, with God, though, God's not Vegas. With God, if you plant seeds into the kingdom of God, you always win. 
In Vegas, you hardly ever win. I've been with some of you, uh, you know, that can do really good in Vegas. And it's just not me. I don't know what the deal is. Uh, but you know what? The reason they have built hotels that are look like pyramids with lights that you can see from outer space, the reason they have, do they still have the Eiffel Tower thing there? The reason they have all this, so you, if you've ever been to Vegas, and you, it's, it's, it's like the most extravagant of extravagant things that you've ever seen when you go down the strip. It's like, it's like how much money can you spend? Well, you know, what, you know how they bought all that stuff? With your money. That's how they bought all that stuff. When you walk in a mall, it looks like you're outside because there's a sky planted, and it, it goes, looks like, for miles, and there's aquariums bigger than your house, and giant fish. And it's like, whoa, my goodness. You know how they bought that? They bought that off of you. But God's not like that. When you plant something in the kingdom of heaven, you always win. It's always coming back. He said, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, he shall also reap. If you sow to the Spirit, you will. Somebody say, I will. You will reap a life everlasting. That's what it says. You will reap. It is coming to pass. Man, when you do something for somebody, don't think, oh, that was just a waste of 10 bucks on the corner to a homeless person. No, it wasn't. It's coming back to you. It may not be as quick as sticker bushes grow up, but I promise you it's coming your way. You just have to keep on giving and keep on doing and keep on reaching. Oh, my goodness. Man, I have had so much, so much fun, so much joy in my life doing for other people. Where people say, well, you know, you're going to get burned. So God's got a fire truck. <laughs> they said that to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they threw him in the fire, too. You're going to get burned. They had a heck of a testimony coming out, didn't they? Too bad there wasn't anybody standing around to tell it to because they all died. But anyway, yeah, the thing is, when you plant seeds in the kingdom of heaven, they are going to come back. Anything you do for somebody, you may not see it right that moment, but when you do something for somebody else, it is coming back to you. Now, the, the thing is, that's not the reason to do it. The reason you do it is because it's really who you are. You may not even know who you are, but th- I can promise you, every single one of you, inside of you is this this God person that is just waiting to do something for somebody else. And the moment you do it, you might be shaking and scared to death, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But when you do it, oh, my goodness, you're going to like, whoo, I'm late for this. I, I'm pretty good at this. We, we used to do a thing with youth, and we, uh, we, we didn't have cards at first. We just called them random acts of kindness. And we rolled into a Walmart once, and we were going to help people with their carts, okay? We are going to help them, like, take their groceries to the car. So you got to picture this, okay? So here you are. You're bagging your groceries. you got them all bagged up, and you put them in a cart. And a teenager comes up to you and takes your cart from you and says, Here, let me help you with that. <laughs> Did not work out too well. Turns out you need a card to say, Hey, we would like to do something nice for you and present that first. Because if you just take their cart and run off, they're chasing you, and they're not real happy. But anyway, <laughs> when you do things for people, the reward is in heaven. Do you know that heaven is a big reward ceremony? It's a big, it's a big ceremony of passing out crowns. Did you know when you get to heaven, have you heard that? You get a crown when you get to heaven. He crowns you king of what you've accomplished in your life. You know what you don't get crowned a king for? Having a really nicely made bed. true. Now, we make our bed, we get up. Leslie makes it much better than I do. Like a nicely made bed. But there's no award ceremony for having every speck of dust gone from your house. There's no award ceremony for that. If, if there was, my wife, she can spot dust and cobwebs. But there's no, you know what, her life is not, that's not what she was made for. She was made for other people. To serve other people, to touch the lives of other people. You're most like Jesus when you're helping others. How many times do we hear at church, you got to be like Jesus? WWJD, what would Jesus do? I'll tell you what he would do. He would help people. That's what he would do. You look at the Bible. Let's read the stories in the Bible. He didn't have this, you know, this 
you know, calendar planner, have his whole day planned out, and, well, I can't stop and help that hungry person, or I can't stop and do this because I'm just too busy doing my other stuff. No, his whole life was about helping other people, doing for other people. You're most like Jesus when you're helping others. Galatians 6, same chapter, a little bit further down. Look what it says in verse 9 and 10. So let us not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the family of faith. You you see this? Whenever we have opportunity, trying to knock on my microphone, it doesn't work that way. Everybody say knock, knock, knock. That's opportunity knocking at your door. When you're in the store and you see someone that looks like they're having a bad day, that's opportunity knocking. When you're at work and someone's not having a good day, that's opportunity knocking. When you're driving down the road and you see someone broke down with a flat tire, that's opportunity. You don't just wave and say, whoa, look at them, I'm so glad I got a good tires. No, you stop. That's what you do. That's opportunity knocking. So that you can be like Jesus. We have opportunity all around us. It's knocking at our door. And it's giving us the chance to be like Jesus. We cannot just blow past it. Say this. Say, we are called for more. I'm going to give you your spiritual job description. The physical job description was have babies and take care of them. And there's a calling in that. Please don't misunderstand me. But you're made for more than that. It's not just to have babies and make sure they got diapers changed and make sure they got food. It's to take those babies and raise them in the fear and admonition of God. It's to raise up the next generation of people. But here's your spiritual job description. You can just write it down. It's real simple. Love God, love others. Sometimes you'll drive past the church and you'll see it on their sign. Love God, love others. It can't be any more simple than that. Your spiritual job description is to love God and to love other people. How do you love other people? When, when Jesus told them that, they, they, you know, they got into an uproar. Got, well, who is my neighbor? Let me, let me give you the verse. Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And I found being a pastor that for, for most of us, we, we're pretty good. At, we, we, do our, we, we do a decent job of that. There's definitely some revelation in some areas we could grow. But most of us in this room would say, I love God. Most of us can get that one right. But it's this next one we have trouble with. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Then he says, there is no commandment greater than these. If you've been to church many times, you've probably heard a message just like this. You've got to love your neighbor. But the reality is, you really have to love your neighbor. You have to be kind. You have to show them who God is. You've got to reveal them, reveal to them, who God is. Acts chapter 13, verse 47. I found this verse, I think, Monday or Tuesday this week. Look what it says. For the Lord gave us this command when he said, I have made you a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the farthest corners of the earth. I don't know. For some reason, that just jumped out to me because he said, I have made you a light. So for some reason, when I read that, it just, it just spoke to me so much differently than, than I have the light of God in me, but I am the light. What you say, I am the light. See, you are the light. I mean, when you, when you realize, I mean, think of it, just, just say you're a flashlight, okay? You're, you're your iPhone light, okay? That's who you are. When God says, you are the light, I have made you the light. What, what is a light for? Shining in darkness, right? I mean, you don't, you don't sh- take a light, and, you know, your flashlight and shine it in your light bulb and go, ooh, got you good. No, that's, that's not what you do. You take a light and you shine it in a dark space, right? That's what you do. And that's what you're called to do. That is who you are. It's, your, it's more than just a calling. It's who you are. Say, I am a light. Say, I am the light. Am the light. No, no, Jesus is the light. No, but he lives in you. That makes you the light. I'm seeing spots because I looked right at that light. I don't know. What I was, I can't even see y'all anymore because that, yeah. That ver, that's Paul talking, and he's he's telling people, I he he's saying that God created. He said God, he said Jesus told me that I am the light. But he's actually quoting a verse in Isaiah, and if you turn to Isaiah chapter forty-two, it expound. He just pulled out this one little thing. I am a light, man. Look what it says. Isaiah chapter forty-two, verses six through seven. I, the Lord, have called you. Everybody say me. He's called you to demonstrate his righteousness. 
Let me say that again. He has called you to demonstrate His righteousness. In other words, you are called to show people the righteousness of God. We'll talk about that in a second. Then he says, I will take you by the hand and guard you. I will give you to my people Israel as a symbol. Say, I'm a symbol. As a symbol of my covenant with them. And you will be a light to guide the nations. Yes, you. Say, I'm a light. You're not just some flimsy light that you didn't charge last night. You are a light to guide the nations. Man, sometimes we can't get ourselves from the, from the, you know, the kitchen to out the door on time. But he's telling us that that's not who you are. You're a light to guide people, to guide nations of people. Look what it says. You will open the eyes of the blind. You will free the captives from prison, releasing those who sit in dark dungeons. Man, somebody go, whoo. That's who you are. You're a light to release people from dark dungeons. You're a light to to get the captives out of prison. You're a light to show the nations where they're supposed to go. So I'll put a few little notes. I'm almost done. We are a symbol of God's covenant. Somebody say a symbol. So what is a symbol? A symbol is a, it's a, it's something that that sh- shows you what it is. A symbol. Money is really just a symbol. That you, have, that you have a job and that, you, that you're able to buy whatever you're trying to buy. A check is a great example of a symbol because a check is just a piece of paper. Did you know that, as far as I know, it's still this way. It used to be this way. You don't have to write a check on a check. You can write a check on a napkin, and as long as it was written like a check and it had the cor- correct information on there, now, now they scan them. But used to, that, that, would, that would have sufficed as a check, a napkin. Isn't that crazy? Does the napkin have any money? No, it doesn't have any money at all. But it's a symbol. And you are a symbol of the covenant of God. You, when people see you, they should say, wow, there must be a God. That's it. When people look at you, they go, man, how's that, how, how's that working out for him? Oh, God's there. It should baffle people when they see you and they realize, because they, come on, we, we, know, we know you. We, we know each other. But what an incredible thing when that hand that is just flesh and skin touches someone else on a shoulder and a prayer is prayed through a mouth made of flesh, but it changes their life forever. That is a symbol of the covenant of God. That check just says there's money in a bank and here's the account. You are the check written to this world. You are the check that people cash when they have a need. When you show up and you help somebody mow their yard, when you help somebody fold their laundry, when you help somebody clean their house because they're sick and they're not able to, you're just taking mundane tasks, but you're doing it, and it's a symbol, and it says God is in the house. God is here. You see, you're a symbol of the proof of the blood of Jesus. We've got to look at our lives, not, not that we are just Christians, but we are proof that he died for us and came back alive. Here at the Uprising, we have a mission statement. It simply says that we exist to bring love, hope, and healing to a world that needs Jesus. The reason that this church is here is to bring love, hope, and healing to a world that needs Jesus. And for the last six, seven years, we've really just focused on those words, love, hope, and healing. Alex and I, a couple weeks ago, we were, we were working on some stuff for Growth Track, and uh, he said something that just really jumped out at me. He said, Dad, we got, we got to focus differently on that love, hope, and healing. we got to focus on the bring it. We bring. Everybody say bring. We bring love, hope, and healing. See, if, we, if we're just focused on love, hope, and healing, it's easy to get that all about me. I need love, I need hope, I need healing. But when you focus on we bring love, hope, and healing, that means I've got some love in my pocket, I've got some hope in my pocket, I've got some healing in my pocket, and I'm bringing it to where you are. Somebody say bring it. 
we got to start bringing it wherever we go. That when we show up, we're not, and, and, and we got to maybe take it another step for that. We're not just not bringing it, but we got to realize that we are love, hope, and healing. Jesus is living inside of me. And if he's living in me and he's living in you, when we show up, we bring love, hope, and healing. We bring change to the situation. When we walk in the room, healing just walked in the room. When we walk in the room, hope showed up. When we walk in the room, love has just been expanded through the atmosphere because we bring Bring it wherever we go. Amen? Stand up with me. Say it again. Say bring it. We just got to get a little attitude. Get a little attitude. Sickness shows up. We're like, oh, I'm going to bring it. You don't want me to show up. Devil, you don't want me showing up in that hospital room because I'm walking in with some healing. You don't want me to show up in, that, in those environments where there's no love and it's just a bunch of bickering and hate and anger. You don't want me showing up there, devil, because when I show up, I bring it. I'm bringing some love. Man, you guys are full of love. The love of God. When you walk in a room, hope should arise. They're just me. No, you're not. You're not just you. You're a child of the Most High God. You're a king's kid. You're a prince and a princess. When you walk in, you represent the covenant of heaven. When you walk in, the blood of Jesus just walked in. And if somebody says, there's no such thing as Jesus, you're, you just standing there says, oh, yes, there is. When somebody says, oh, God doesn't forgive sin anymore, your life is an affront to the devil. And your life says, you, don't, you, you may think there's no such thing as the cross. You might think that Jesus was just a dude. But let me assure you, his blood is alive and well, and it has washed my sins away. <laughs> Hallelujah. You are love. You are hope. You are healing. Everywhere you go. So that means if you're out there in your half-acre pasture, sticker plants. If you're sick and tired, cut stickers. 20 years later, God can remind you of that. And tell you, you know what, Gary? Don't plant sticker seeds. Plant some Holy Ghost. Plant some love. Plant things that matter. Let's bow our heads.